Hello and welcome everyone to the ninth episode of Bright Garden Voices. My name is Raf Mamadov and I'm one of the co-organizers of this project. Bright Garden Voices is a grassroots initiative which provides a platform for constructive dialogue between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. We host online meetings where guests from both sides share their experiences and ideas relating to the Azerbaijani-Armenian conflict or any other matter relating to the two nations. Our meetings also include live interaction with our audience and the meetings are recorded and made available on YouTube and as podcasts. Bright Garden Voices is not affiliated with nor funded by any organization or government and doesn't support to represent any nation, state or group. Today, our collaborators are Andre Mansurian and Leila Emindi. They'll be joining me as co-hosts. Leila. Thank you, Ralph, and hello once again, everyone. My name is Leila Eminli, and I was born, raised, and currently living in Azerbaijan. So I'm a senior year undergrad student in public affairs. And in addition to this area, my research interest and passion lie in gender studies and women rights, and what can be done to further improve those in uh, our country. And when it comes to becoming a Bright Garden Voices collaborator, I found that through Twitter, and as I have an interest in Armenian-Azerbaijan conflict, I joined BGV without a second thought. And I believe in the power of uh, peaceful dialogue and hope to play at least a small role in this uh, constructing the dialogue since nowadays it's more than ever very important for us. Thank you. And I'm passing the floor to Andrea. Thank you, Leila. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrea. I'm Armenian and I'm uh, one of the other court, uh, Bright Garden Voices coordinators. I currently live in the United States. I'm also a graduate student studying history. My passion for history stems from my appreciation of our world's complexity and the interconnectedness among people, cultures, ideas, experiences, and different histories. The Armenian and Azerbaijani conflict is an area I have had deep interest in. And the more I learned about the conflict, I soon recognized the need for constructive dialogue within our communities. And I believe that that need for a dialogue is more crucial today. I'm gonna to hand it back to you, Roth. Yeah, and uh, today's meeting, I'm gonna introduce about uh, the topic of the meeting. Today we'll be talking about social media influencers. Um, over the last decade, social media's importance has grown rapidly. And in today's world, everyone is, in, is on social media. The growing importance of social media has produced a new phenomenon called social media influencers. Influencers are people who have built a reputation for their knowledge and expertise on a specific topics. And today we have two of those influencers. Uh, we have Armenian and Azerbaijani social media influencers, Rich and Jabit, and they will be sharing their experience with us. Andrea. Thank you, Rolf. So we're gonna move to today's agenda. Uh, Rolf just introduced the project and we the moderators introduced ourselves as well. Next, we'll have a discussion with our guests. After that, we'll open the virtual floor to the audience for any questions. The audience may either forward their questions to Arnold directly, or they may ask the questions directly if they have their cameras and microphones on uh, to the guests. We will end the meeting with a few closing remarks. And lastly, the meeting will be recorded and made available online. If you don't want your real name on record, you can use your first, uh, first name or a pseudonym. And now let's go to Layla for our house rules. Thank you. So we have several basic house rules for our meetings. So first of all, we ask you to respect uh, the one another in constructing dialogues. In short, we do not tolerate insults, disrespectful language, generalizations about any ethnicity, denialism of trauma or events. And we call for all of you to empathize and not accuse each other. So every participant is the only one responsible for what they say and is not here to represent any government or nation or any sites. And please kind of remember that we are not here to agree with one another and it's more than okay to disagree since we are discussing topics and we are basically here to listen to one another and talk. So um, yeah, thank you. I think Leila now introduces um, Rich, and then Andrea will introduce uh, Javid. Yep, thank you. So uh, Rich is based in Los Angeles, and he's a cartographer and analyzes geopolitical events, focusing on the Caucasus since 2014. 
And Rich holds a dual degree in geography and international relations from San Francisco State University. And he's also a former captain of the Armenian national basketball team from 2015 to 2016. And his research has looked into xenophobia in Germany and cartographically projecting the Syrian refugee crisis. And since 2020, Rich has utilized satire to explain the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict to a majority diaspora base. And now I'm passing the floor to Andrea to introduce Javid. Thank you, Leila. So Javid is a writer and a social media researcher with an interest in learning dead and endangered languages. He considers himself an individual anarchist libertarian politically. He's 28 years old and based in Baku, Azerbaijan. And thank you both for joining us, Javid and Rich. We'll go ahead and start with the questions. Um, Javid, I'll start with you first. What social media platform do you use and who is your audience? Uh, thanks for inviting me and uh, welcome to every participant. Uh, I mainly use Twitter, uh, which is not a popular, not the popular uh, platform on Azerbaijan. On Azerbaijan, it's mostly uh, Facebook. Uh, I guess it's the uh, same for most uh, post-Soviet countries about Russia. Uh, in a, in uh, Facebook, my publications are usually in Azerbaijani, but on Twitter, I try to maintain uh, a heterogeneous presence, like both Azerbaijani and English, sometimes even Turkish too. And yeah, that's, these are the main platforms I use. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Leila, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Andrea. So Rich, uh, the same question again, what social media platform do you use and who's your main audience in that platforms? Well, firstly, thank you all for having me and thank you all that's joining us today. Um, privileged. Um, so I mainly utilize Instagram. Uh, I also utilize TikTok, which as silly as it may sound, uh, it's different generations that I'm reaching out to. Instagram has a majority um, uh, millennial and also Gen Z, Gen X, while TikTok is majority Gen Z, Gen X. Um, and those are the main two platforms in terms of more in-depth uh, writing and, and just overall providing my research. I tend to go more towards Twitter. And those are the three uh, bases that I mainly utilize. Thank you. So now going back to Andrea. Okay, so Javi, this is for you. Uh, could you describe your experience communicating information throughout the war? And why did you decide to do so? Um, at first, uh, this, the second uh, Karabakh war was not my, uh, it's, it all started actually uh, back in the four day war, uh, back in the 2014, I guess, uh, when uh, there was a small hill captured by Azerbaijanis, but uh, even in, four days, uh, four days, uh, social media has, has been flooded with uh, misinformation, disinformation, some fake information, even provided by the each side in order to, I, I don't know, maybe boost morale or something. Uh, but uh, I've seen that these uh, fake and harm, harmful informations uh, are, visually, are usually very hurtful. Uh, the, and uh, I decided to go against it and um, tweet some stuff like uh, trans, most the translation from uh, main Yurik Armenian and to uh, translate to English and to provide uh, my followers from different backgrounds to what Azerbaijanis are saying. Uh, it does not mean what is really happening, but how other Bajanis are transmitting it. Uh, but that was my main uh, intention. Then uh, after the July clashes and uh, the second Karabakh war, uh, uh, after that I just, uh, I, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I think that I just, I did the thing I think I tried to 
uh, yeah, I, I guess you know what I mean. Uh, it, but I, my main concern was to cut these uh, unnecessary extent, uh, like our glorious army, I cut these glorious parts, or uh, the rabbit enemy or something. <laughs> I cut the rabbit part in order to just to provide pure information. And uh, sometimes I even had some misconceptions so far, but uh, I was mis misunderstood as well. Uh, but we'll talk about it later. Thank you, David. Uh, Leila? Thank you, Andrea. So, Rich, now can you please also describe your experience with communicating information throughout the war and why did you decide to do it in that way? Yeah, I mean, uh, many would know uh, my work up until July 2020, it was mainly comedy. It wasn't even politically based. Um, majority of my work was being done behind the scenes. I didn't really present it to an audience out there because I wasn't really sure how it would be taken. Um, but when the July skirmishes took place, a lot of people didn't understand, is it war, is it skirmishes, what's the difference between that? So in 2020, it was almost like go time when, um, September came around and and I had a couple of my accounts actually hacked and I couldn't open it back. So then I had to start all over um, when the actual war began. And I found it and similar to how Javid said, it's just, it's kind of, it's hard to explain. But uh, in that moment, you realize that it's just go time. A lot of people are lacking information where it's level-headed and not necessarily complete uh, propaganda, uh, given that wartime is that moment where um, each side is marketing their perspective. And it's not a dualism, it's actually multiple different agendas being uh, thrown at you uh, during that very sophisticated time. So I found it very necessary to kind of weed out the, uh, the words such as like, you know, like how Javid said, glorious and, and whatnot, and really present it in uh, a satirical way where, um, you know, some of my references could be George Carlin, uh, Steve Colbert, uh, you know, John Oliver, similar likings where um, you take complex information and you, and you try not to oversimplify, but to simplify it to a point where an audience that doesn't have a political science background can digest it with uh, understanding that wartime is a emotional time and that it can take a toll on a person's uh, emotional being, uh, may be a result of mental health issues or, you know, even just as simple as a panic attack at some point. So I try to keep it light. Um, and, you know, it, it, I think the timing was perfect for me to, to really present my work um, during the war. Thank you for the answer. Now, Andrea, back to you. Thank you. Okay, so Javid, uh, you've, this question's for both of you, but I'll start with you, Javid. So you've both stood out for always trying to keep a neutral and aggressive free tone. How has that experience been like? Um, have you received any backlash for not being quote unquote patriotic enough? Uh, it's a very good question because I have uh, lots of experience in it. Uh, I was, uh, as I said, I tried to look at it the way when I when I was uh, tried to transmit the news. Uh, what what I've been saying on Russian side, Iranian side, or Azerbaijan side. Um, but some uh, sometimes uh, when we don't have uh, enough evidence on our hands, we have to use allegedly or Azerbaijani Minister of Defense claims or we have to use these words in order, if there is not uh, proof, let's say a video on, on our hand. So we have been, I'm not a journalist, but uh, as a reader, um, uh, I think that it is most ethical way to use that. But I've seen, I've seen a lot of uh, victims, criticisms toward this, but, and, uh, uh, Admiral states or like Minister of Defense states, President Ali states, and uh, I tried to make stuff much more simpler. And I was, uh, I was like uh, called a traitor or something, not patriotic. Uh, it was mostly because uh, during during the war there has been an ongoing information war, and uh, when you are an info warrior, you have to. 
like uh, send everything on your hand to the other side. I just, uh, just as I've said, provides a simple messages. And since I am also a researcher in uh, and other stuff history, I just put one or three here and there some background information about how other. I guess it was this was misunderstood. They thought that uh, I am actually having an opinion on that. Anyway, uh, that this was the, my my general uh, experience. But other than that. Uh, during the war, I had not uh, so much uh, trouble about that. That's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that, Javid. Uh, Leila, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. So the same question to you, Rich, again. Uh, you both stood out for always trying to keep a neutral and aggression-free tone. And how has that experience been like? And have you received backlash for not being patriotic enough? Well, you know, the criticisms, uh, you, you can always receive it. It's just a matter of how emotionally intelligent you can be about it, right? Um, there's various opinions coming, but specifically, I've tried to narrow it down as to why I've been received this, right? Being considered not patriotic enough. Well, I've represented the Armenian national basketball team before, so I'm pretty sure that I'm patriotic enough, flying uh, 16 hours uh, to play in a tournament you know, uh, dedicate my body and my mind to it for at least six months. Um, and, but in terms of why the, the conversation of that comes about, well, the diaspora in itself as a study, diasporic studies is relatively a new concept. Um, and, you know, one, one person that I would like to bring up a lot is Khachik Talolian. And he mentions how the diaspora is a very fluid entity. So those words being thrown at me or, you know, uh, any kind of use, use of words such as traitor or treasonous, um, it, it becomes a little difficult to understand for me because um, we're in the diaspora here and we're, we're on the outside looking in. Um, I'm trying my best to explain to an audience that doesn't even understand where Armenia is on a map or where Azerbaijan is on the map. Um, and it's, it, it, it's becoming a little difficult to explain people of the, the certain terminology you can use um, just doesn't rub the people the right way if they're taking in information um, from a neutral perspective. And of course, you can have your personal opinion. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I am Armenian, Javid is Azerbaijani. And, you know, you, you can have your personal experiences, but when it comes to your professional work, when it comes to um, transferring information from point A to point B, uh, you have to take that aside and put it in the place where you can really explain it to people that don't even understand this conflict. I mean, many people didn't even know what Nagorno-Karabakh was. Even in the Armenian community, when the conflict erupted, they didn't know that this was the main topic. They, they just felt the pain of the genocide. And that was the only thing they remembered. Um, so overall, um, I, I tried to make it digestible so that way, the conversation of, of a patriot or not a patriot, it doesn't matter for me because at the end of the day, my, my goal is to reach to an audience that isn't even Armenian or Azerbaijani, really. Thank you for the response. Andrea, back to you now. Thank you. Okay, so Javid. So some Armenian and Azerbaijani influential people ranging from academics and activists to politicians have circulated demeaning and hateful um, narratives and rhetoric on social media, including the sharing of false misleading information. What is your opinion about this and what kind of impact do you think this has? Uh, I guess it started, uh, it has been ongoing uh, for more than a decade, I guess. And about uh, with the inclusion of social media in this uh, war, and especially when uh, Ali started uh, posting these uh, and uh, he, uh, ex uh, giving news about some villages and stuff, people just jumped on the Twitter. Before that, Azerbaijani influenced Azerbaijani social. Uh, Twitter's uh, uh, influence on Azerbaijan's social media 
was not very good. Uh, we had like very few uh, users and everyone knew everyone October 2020. We have seen lots of uh, Azerbaijan account registrations on Twitter. And uh, some of these were academicians, as you said, uh, politicians, or just uh, random workers, uh, people, students who just saw Aliyev do it and came. And uh, the, the understanding, I guess, this was a new phenomena that people were uh, dealing with. If I'm on social media, if I'm on Twitter, now I have to uh, fight Armenians with everything I have. And uh, these of the, most of the time also turned to uh, insults. And Twitter, since Twitter had, uh, I guess they were uh, overwhelmed. And uh, they just at, at one point, they just banned everyone. And after only a few year, a few months later, they just they turned people back. And there has been lots of fake news. And for the, on my on my case uh, that uh, Ganja Airport was bombed, but uh, then looking at just simple Google image search, reverse search, they will that uh, it, it was not that the case. It was an Ukrainian airport uh, which was damaged during the Donbas conflict with Russia, and uh, for example, Stefan Kian posted on Instagram that uh, right now. Azerbaijani people are protesting against governments uh, as well. uh, So I don't know why people s s share this information. I don't know, maybe in order to spread panic or not. But simply, uh, simply we have seen that none of these helped, in fact, and uh, it only made things worse. And the reason we are here right now is that we, try, we are trying to amend the stuff. I mean, uh, the damage done right now in order to explain ourselves again. I think uh, these were the most problems I've seen. Uh, and uh, only thing we can, only way we can deal with this is just to fact check everything. Whomever helps. Uh. Thank you. It's a very good point to bring up. Um, Leila? Thank you, Andrea. So some Armenian and Azerbaijan influential people ranging from academics as mentioned and activists to politicians have circulated demeaning and hateful narratives and rhetoric on social media and including the sharing of false or misleading information. And Rich, what is your opinion about this and what kind of impact do you think this has? Well, uh, social media in itself, and this is also a new concept, right, is, is information war. And it's equally found a place in, in, con in new gen conventional war, as we've seen it. And it's, it's becoming problematic and, and pretty dangerous. I mean, when you compare it from 2016 to now, there's been severe advancements in social media, especially with the aftermath of COVID. Many people have tend to rely on the news they receive from Facebook, um, uh, whether it's on Instagram and, and Twitter, and it becomes easy for fact checking to, or, or self fact checking for that matter, to, to kind of go away. So I feel like it's, it's pretty dangerous because it further uh, isolates the non uh, political science background folks from really identifying what's what or being able to at least decipher it on their own, um, instead of taking a tweet and seeing it as the holy grail of information for them. Um, and one example I want to give is actually the Tehran Times with the latest escalations happening between Iran and Azerbaijan actually uh, sourced a couple of online uh, uh, sources where they mentioned how uh, the current situation is being further destabilized by uh, online uh, uh, information uh, sharing platforms uh, and providing fake news. Now, whether that's actually true or not, of course, Tehran Times is uh, state-owned, uh, I, I can't be sure. But nonetheless, uh, information has the ability to destabilize situations, and especially when you have social media where it's fast-paced, real-time, 
uh, it might not necessarily correlate with uh, what you see in, for example, geolocation. Uh, that's one thing that I was really keen on in terms of during the war, uh, reading what uh, the news is telling us in contrast to necessarily uh, what the Ministry of Defenses are saying, and then kind of geolocating those locations and really looking down into it. Um, and, and open sources is the positive side of social media, of course, but sometimes it can be used uh, malevol uh, malevolently uh, to push an agenda of some sorts, and, and that could vary depending on what side of the aisle you're on. Thank you, Rich, for your response. Now, Andrea, back to you. Thank you. So, Javid, you've studied a lot about Caucasian Albanians and Udis, which are usually mobilized in the conflict against Armenia uh, in Azerbaijan. How has your study of them helped you understand more about this instr instrumentalization? Uh, thanks. It's also a, a good question. Uh, the <clears throat> I started to look into Caucasian Albanians when I was actually a kid. Uh, back in back in the school, uh, they thought that there was an ancient kingdom that used to be Christian, and then. Our, came, we have become Islamic, the children of this amalgamation, this mix. So it was very interesting to me because uh, since there were very little information on this kingdom, uh, and especially its history and its uh, language, uh, as I said, I, I, I have a huge interest in Latin language in Istanbul University, and this also uh, gained my attention. And then, then when I dived in the language into Caucasian Albanians, I've seen that it's actually uh, just the older version of after this during the war and before the war. I, in our history books and Wikipedia even, uh, the most of the churches uh, that have been built in medieval times in, in uh, Karabat uh, were uh, regarded as Albanian churches. And uh, most of the time are temples. I don't know what was the point there, but still they call the temples. And uh, after after the, uh, <clears throat> after the decipherment of Caucasian Albanian alphabet, which was uh, done by Zaza Alexidze, the Georgian uh, researcher, um, uh, Joss Gippert, and Wolfgang Schulze. Uh, after learning and studying their heritage, I think that I thought that uh, this should be shared. And uh, I've been made the, uh, the admin of this page that we are seeing right now on uh, on the screen. Uh, it's uh, it's also it used but it's co-administered by uh, share what I know and in, in order to fight against this uh, misinformation to give the background give the knowledge on who these people were really what language they speak uh, where the etymology is why in their words. I think uh, this was a very interesting experience for me. Right now, uh, I think that Udis are being uh, misused by the Azerbaijani government. Sure, they have they have this heritage and uh, common history with of Karabakh, but uh, we have to we have to study more thoroughly uh, to in before making any claims. Uh, I've seen uh, some very like um, understandable, uh, very uh, dramatic claims that these churches that been built in 19th century, just right after Russian occupation of the Caucasus, these were ridiculous for me. But I guess since we don't have much experts, Caucasus in general, uh, it's a very free free uh, place 
to uh, there is much more freedom to move around on on such matters on this theory and i guess uh, and i guess we need to have much more uh, researchers from the caucasus georgia armenia and azerbaijan to talk about this uh, we need to research it uh, if not anything but for the since this is the UDS heritage they are endangered people Thank you. That's very interesting, and you brought a lot of good points. Uh, Thank you. So, uh, Rich, you often appeal to humor or non-conventional creative means when communicating some serious issues on your accounts. And can you share your reasoning behind your choices? I feel people are able to take in information and share it without having too much uh, pressure on themselves, pressure on the receiver of the information. So for example, um, during the, the, the Syrian conflict, I noticed that a lot of my friends, both Assyrian and Syrian backgrounds, they were very devastated and they were just showing me very, very difficult information to digest. And at that time, of course, I hadn't experienced neither the 2016 nor the 2020 from a digital perspective. And they were having a tough time explaining to me in person and also showing me an article um, unfortunately, I understand that I have the um, that I have the basis of being able to read an article, decipher it, and whatnot. But I said, you know, if I give this to my friend who is an electrical engineer, he's probably going to lose interest. And it's not because the topic isn't necessarily information. I mean, is it important? Excuse me, but it's because he doesn't have uh, the the institutional background to really take this on. And whether it's a high school student, whether it's a college student, whether it's someone that's just been stuck in their nine to five job forever, and they just have a TikTok they're scrolling through or an Instagram post, I figured, well, there's so much information out there, might as well throw this in there, uh, something, something benevolent on my end, to be able to explain a conflict from a much more digestible per, uh, perspective. In terms of where comedy has its place, um, some people can't, you know, are not amused by it, some people uh, don't find it uh, attractive for them as, as a source of information. And I understand that. Um, and, and I'm very open to that. And I'm very open to the criticism. But I feel like that comedy goes such a long way. It's, it's one of the oldest arts that we have. It's one of the only forms that it can bring uh, a, a heavy situation into a light uh, information. So comedy, in my perspective, and like I've referenced before, George Carlin, uh, it's one way to be able to transfer um, information from point A to point B. Thank you, Rich, for explaining it clearly. Now, Andrea, back to you again. Thank you. So, Javid, uh, in your role as a communicator, do you think you can help in reaching better understanding between, between Armenians and uh, Azerbaijanis? How? Would you do this and would you have a message to fellow influencers or people with a platform like yours um i guess um i, I should i should uh, confess that uh, before the war uh, we had not much interaction i had not much interaction with uh armenians and uh, Oh, Javid, I think we lost your, we can't hear you right now. I guess the, so, um, do, can you hear me right now? Uh, yes, but it kind of comes and goes. Maybe the connection's a little rough. Um, okay. I can um, hear you. How is it now? How yeah, is my can, voice? We can hear you now. It's better. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, ironically, during the war, I found um, more peace-minded and more, uh, at least, a dialogue, uh, dialogue with the Armenians and Azerbaijanis, uh, you, know, you know, opposed to the time before the war. And I believe that uh, hard times may be the main, main cause and the, you have to know the guy on the other side much more better in order to deal with them. So I, I, 
I tried to explain some uh, miscon misconceptions or uh, another understanding in uh, Azerbaijani community about uh, Armenians. Uh, and uh, we have, I've talked about some these wartime movies that shaped our uh, childhood, uh, for example, Fariat Scream. And uh, I guess uh, it's, it helped some people to, to on, on Armenian side to understand how people actually felt. And uh, I also came across the, the story, stories of uh, people uh, who had uh, have been exiled or uh, had to leave their homes in uh, back in Baku or Sungayeti, the stories of Armenians and how they felt about the uh, current conflict. We shared uh, some stories, some of them uh, were not public. Uh, I guess they were rightly uh, afraid of uh, any uh, reactions they could get. So some of most of these conversations were on private, but I'm glad that I, I had such uh, different views coming from different sources. I, I, I guess it helped to broaden my worldview, especially in this conflict. I think just by talking, just by sharing the narratives, we can understand each ourselves, ourselves better. Uh, I think uh, even a small sentence it helps a lot. Thank you. That was a wonderful explanation. Leila, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Andrea. So, uh, Rich, the same question to you again. And role of communicator, do you think you can help in reaching better understanding between Armenians and Azerbaijanis? And how would you do that? And would you have a message to fellow influencers or people with a platform like yourself? Yes, um, so I think majority or, or many people, I shouldn't say majority, would agree that on a government level, the communication has not been successful in the past 30 years, at least since uh, countries broke out into two. Um, and it's very difficult to follow the lead when the governments are not doing necessarily a great job at that. So at a civilian level, we need to understand that this is not an IGO, this is not an NGO, you know, and and civilians have to have the open mind to be open to dialogue. Uh, the very basic foundation is dialogue. And, and you know, I, I wholeheartedly believe in the idea that in order to be able to criticize your neighbor, you must be able to speak to them in the first place. Um, and my goal or my message would be to at least be open to communication because um, it's just a constant echo back to yourself if you're you know, if you're just talking amongst yourselves in, in a community, or if you identify within a community and you're unable to really reach out, out um, to, to reason with the person. Um, so, I, I mean, that, that's my goal. I mean, it's especially uh, in, an, in a time, of, in the age of information, you have to take advantage of these things, uh, you know, at the comfort of your home, because a lot of people, they, they feel like the security is the one of the biggest issues. Well, if security is one of the biggest issues, you can feel free to utilize one of the platforms such as this. And I feel like there's nothing wrong in simply talking to a person if your security is provided, right? So uh, that's how I see these things. And, and if other people can, can also join in on this, then, then wonderful. But, um, you know, if, if some people are not just not ready yet, that's also uh, understandable too. Uh, like we've mentioned, there's been many uh, traumatic experiences throughout the caucuses and, and many of us are living in the diaspora for that exact reason. Uh, my parents being one of them, right? And, um, and I'd like to share a small story if, if, I, if I may. Um, in, when I was 11 years old, I was actually living in Armenia um, and I was talking to my grandfather and we were looking at the map and I was like, grandpa, like why are some of the roads intertwining? Like they go in and out, in and out, uh, out of the Soviet jurisdictions. And my grandfather said, well, the Soviets wanted us to, ha to have to rely on each other. You know, we have to work with one another, you know, and, and that's one of the main bases as to why I got into cartography in the first place to really understand how infrastructure uh, really pushes us to interact with one another, especially under the Soviet Union. So um, 
I'd like to just leave it on that. Um, and for those that are just more interested in understanding that, I highly recommend looking into Soviet maps and, and trying to understand how it worked uh, in order to understand how, in today's age, maybe a blueprint of how maybe we can look forward as well. Thank you for your response. And I think now we will open the floor for the questions for our participants. So if you have any questions, please uh, forward them to me as a direct message. Or yeah, just let me know uh, as a direct message and I will let you speak if you have your uh, microphone and camera on. We have already, we have one question. Are you here, Onik? Do you wanna ask a question yourself? Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thank you. I was just typing uh, the question. Um, first of all, Javid and I have known several, uh, each other several years, but Rich is new for me, and I've been enormously impressed by the interviews uh, that I've, I've, I've seen, and the idea that there are complex issues and matters that need to be distilled into a much smaller, more easily consumable um, uh, form for TikTok, for Instagram. Um, this is something that NGOs and um, academics have really failed to do. Are you getting any good positive feedback and have there been some positive results? Yes, actually. Um, and Onik, pleasure to meet you. I've, I've been following you, I believe on Twitter, if this is you. So I appreciate you um, um, for, for, this, for this moment. Um, yes, I have been reached out. Um, the USC Armenian studies were impressed by it. Um, I got uh, reached out by the Harvard Graduate School of Design um, because they understood that I was utilizing social media to present Google Earth uh, 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 mapping that I was doing uh, throughout the conflict. I was geolocating many of the different information that was coming out, um, and I presented my work there. Uh, and they were just really interested in how I was navigating in real time, uh, given that it takes a long time for research to be even, uh, you know, to go public um, or to get approved, all these institutional loopholes, um, I mean, it's all these inst institutional barricades. Um, so, yes, I, I have been reached out by academia and just trying to understand how we can make it much more accessible to a new generation, um, because I, I do understand that you know, with the algorithms of social media with, you know, in my background as, as a postgraduate broke student, right? I mean, uh, or broke professional after being a student um, that you work in different places. And I had the opportunity to work in search engine optimization. I, I worked in website development. I worked in social media marketing for at least three years. So, you know, I, I was able to really take this concept and have that research background and kind of sculpt it in a way where a new generation could, could take that on. So, yeah, I, I want to say uh, I'm very thankful that USC Armenian Studies has 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 you know provided that platform and 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 you know and Harvard and, and not only that but Snapchat Discover you know that also provides a, a cool little background for those who kind of go for the wow like the the PMW of social media if you want to call it that and it's very applicable for the caucuses so uh, yeah I, I would explain it in that in that way. Great. Um, was that it, Onik? Uh, did you have anything for Javid? Okay, so maybe I can, I was just typing it out to you uh, again. Um, for both of you, so emotions, obviously, uh, and it's not just Armenia, Azerbaijan context, it's also Trump, it's Brexit, it's everywhere, right? When people are angry, they share more. Um, and things go viral more when people are, um, uh, are angry. How do we uh, utilize important but lesser uh, emotions, you know? I mean, humor, I understand, it's really important. But the anger seems to be what drives people most of all. And a second issue, which maybe even Katie, if she's still here, might want to uh, um, um, contribute something to, is the issue of security. Not about your and, Jav uh, your and Javid security, but for many, many people, being exposed online 
also could create problems for them in, in reality. So I, I guess I'd like to hear both your responses to that. Um, Javid, you can go first for this one. Um, that's a question that I find hard to answer because uh, the, the, I was I literally had to take a day off from the war. Like, how, however you may understand that, I just uh, took a day off from reporting just to uh, shook off all this negativity on me and all these. Uh, during the war, I have slept for like maybe four or five hours at best. I was always online just um, knowing that my friends uh, are in the war currently. And actually I have lost a friend and uh, it, it, it sh I tried to keep my sanity. I don't know how I managed that, I, but it only took me a day to stay off the, all this negativity. But I understand that it might be much more harder for many people. And I guess uh, in order to tackle this, in order to fight against this, we need to have much more uh, experts on this field. What I've been saying, so the people who, are, uh, who dealt with PTSD before, people who dealt with harassment and bullying online before, uh, I think that we are going to need them a lot uh, after the post-war. Uh, I, I really can't explain how I did that, but I, I think that I managed this to a degree. So I may not be the best person to talk about that. Thank you, Javid. Uh, Rich? Yeah, um, emotions run high. And, you know, that, that's, of course, very, very understandable. And personally, in my experience, and, and I, I don't want to, you know, oversimplify in, in any context, but I, I've been in high pressure situations, right? And, and I understand that when everything's on the line, when the whole country's watching you on that TV. And, and for example, we were playing Georgia in, in basketball and, and there was this moment where everyone was itching to, to see who wins. And there's this nationalist um, uh, uh, pride inside that, hey, my team won, that team won. So, you know, after a war, it, it's even worse than obviously. And this doesn't even need to be explained, right? And when it comes to being able to transfer information in such a delicate time and you know, I've lost family friends. I've lost friends as well during this war. It, it's very hard. But at the end of the day, I have to look at it as a profession and, and understand it and, and, you know, for what it is, take the data for what it is. And I can't criticize something unless I look into it really um, in the first place. And that's something I tried to, to teach my followers as well. Um, there was a moment where, you know, uh, I, I tried getting more in, into explanation of this and not many, it wasn't getting too, too many people, but at least I was sparking that idea in their mind um, in, to, to be open to, you know, uh, controlling their emotions during this time. And, you know, I have so many friends that even, even though we're watching it from the screens, we're, they were like, I don't understand how I can feel this way when I wasn't in the war. You know, like it, it's, it's very difficult. So um, it, it's it's a very difficult topic. And I, I'm not even sure if, if I'm the best example to be speaking on this, but I could speak to, speak for myself, you know, given that I was getting two hours a night during the, the 44 days. And then one day, two months later, I get hit with a panic attack. And I'm like, damn, like that that really consumed me. It really takes a toll on your physical on your physical being. So. With that being said, in terms of security, I, I know it becomes an issue as well, but I like to take advantage of the moment of being in the diaspora, being in an area like the United States of such diversity and being able to um, exchange ideas, whether it's in person or it's online like this. Um, and I feel like that helps at least in the dialogue in, in further creating a buffer for my own security as well. So uh, getting my thoughts across, even though in TikTok and Twitter and Instagram is very limited, uh, I like to make it consistent. That way there's a paper trail of, of what, what I'm about and, and what I hope people can take from it. Thank you, Rich. Uh, and I believe Onik mentioned Katie Pierce. Uh, if Katie has something she wants to say, you can unmute yourself and go for it. Before Katie says something, uh, 
both Javid and, and Rich mentioned about their experience about the panic attacks, post-conflict panic attacks and PTSD. I just want to remind that Bright Garden Voices have a uh, episode uh, about the topic. Please feel free to uh, to listen to our experts from both Armenia and Azerbaijan on uh, professionals on, on PTSD and uh, on trauma. Thank you. Great. Um, Kitty, again, uh, did you have anything you wanted to say? She just commented on the chat okay. saying she's driving. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. To the pumpkin patch. <laughs> we have actually a question from our very own Bright Garden co founder and co director, Diego. Please. I don't need so much presentation. <laughs> just say Diego. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, Javid, about this Words Not Words initiative that we shared the, on the slideshow, um, which I believe started in the skirmishes in July last year. And I, I wanted to ask you about it. Like, I think you were one of the, I don't know, who were the, who, who started it? How did you, be, how did you know each other? How did it work? Did it have, I mean, what impact did it have? So I, I wanted to ask you if you could share a little bit about that initiative last year. Um, thank you. I guess maybe you can uh, go to that uh, slide again. Yeah. Uh, you can actually, yeah, you can, so that people can see the text. Yeah, just let me put it. Yeah. There we go. And okay, I thank you. Uh, so uh, it was like, uh, I don't know where it started. I guess it started with uh, LA, uh, if I'm not mistaken, or San Francisco, definitely America. Then it, then it spread to these intercommunal uh, fights, then it's, uh, spread to the Russia and uh, Europe and other diasporas. And uh, it has been rough, and we have edited this text like a lot how to make it perfect, how to make it. Uh, to not to touch anyone and um, how to make their how to make it uh, much more shareable and much more uh, impactful and we had to come up with a hashtag in order to make it uh, more popular and much more viral and then we had to translate it to Armenian and Azerbaijani the Azerbaijani translation uh, was corrected by me and uh, I guess Artyom came up with the hashtag words not swords. And our entire goal was to make all these uh, interactions in, as the diaspora members uh, much more civil uh, as much as possible. And remember that uh, we are in another country. Remember that we are representing our uh, societies and uh, try to keep uh, civil, civility between each other. And I don't know, I, I guess that uh, we have uh, accumulated uh, more than uh, a thousand, maybe uh, more than a thousand and five hundred signatures uh, all above the globe from Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Uh, some of these, some of the people were like actually uh, both Azerbaijani and Armenia, uh, Armenian uh, had these both ancestries. Uh, I forgot the names, but there have been laws. Uh, I, I guess that uh, we tried to make a small impact and we, mo we wanted to make it much more viral and shared around. Uh, more like, uh, why, do you, why would you watch a video of call to violence? Uh, when you can have, when you can just share our message. Uh, yeah, that was the, that was our, in, what our initiative planned. And uh, that's, that's what I can say. <clears throat> Thank you. So, um, Katie has generously actually uh, written a statement uh, in regards to Onik's previous question. And um, she says that, I think this is her own words. 
I think that people do need to cons- do need to consider that disclosing sensitive uh, things, especially regarding the conflict, is very risky for most people. It is not just about angering the government, but uh, angering your neighbor or your relative. And so most people reasonably do not disclose. But these are real concerns and people really do feel the negative outcomes. So we all need to support those who disclose or share their views. And when people are attacked, support them. Uh, Our next question we have, we have Paul, is Paul here? Uh, You can ask your question yourself, Paul. Okay. I don't, I don't know, maybe some of what uh, I've said has been partly addressed, uh, but it, what has been talked about here also kind of reinforces what I was already thinking, like uh, from personal experience, what Katie said about how when you disclose who you are, it does <clears throat> make you a target. Uh, I mean, there was somebody via Twitter who knows my family and has a lot of ties to my family who turned to attacking me constantly. And it really does make this weird situation where you used to know people in real life, but with quarantine, we haven't seen each other in a long time. And everyone has kind of gone into these social media bubbles, even worse than we already were in. And then there, you know, people say things online that they wouldn't say in person. And it's created this very weird world for all of us. But what I was going to say is, uh, my question was along the lines of, Uh, As you know, there's a lot of toxic rhetoric between both sides of the conflict and the info war has really been a major front in the actual war. Um, But then there's a lot of it within our own communities as well. Uh, As I just alluded, you know, I I don't know, I feel like a particular lightning rod for that kind of uh, criticism because I am, my my identity is public, whereas almost everyone that heckles me and, and calls me all kinds of names is not public. And I know that people who are not public in that way are are not trying to have a good faith discussion or, you know, we're always going to have those voices, but are there best best practices or strategies that you kind of have in mind or have identified for dealing with just the intercommunal tensions? Because not everybody is, like I said, not everybody is anonymous. And some people do at least in their opinion they feel like that they are you know letting their voices be heard and saying what they think needs to be said and everyone is entitled to that but at the same time when it's so based in personal attacks uh it it gets you know it becomes very where where is the line of you know i don't know so I, i i think we've discussed this a little bit but if you have anything else to add about best ways for dealing with those within our own community you know how to deflect those calls of traitor and without, you know, I don't know, that, that, that's kind of what I've just been thinking about. There's, there's been a lot going on. So uh, <laughs> thanks for listening. Uh, any comments, uh, Reach or Charlie? I'll, I'll, I'll take this one maybe. Um, hey, Paul, we, we've interacted on social media, but definitely not one to, to, to just, you know, send hurtful stuff. So it's a pleasure to meet you in, uh, digitally too. Um, I just don't reply, honestly. Um, I've been, maybe that's just my training over the years of, you know, just if you're on the, if you're on the sideline, then I'm, I'm not interacting with, with the people on the sideline. I'm interacting with the people on the court. Um, and if, you know, the person on the court is disrespecting me, then my, my own success is going to be the only way that I'm going to, you know, really push, push myself and, and go further. Now, in terms of the accounts that don't necessarily have a face to it or whatever, I, I, I find them very irrelevant um, unless they are a uh, open source that usually is not participating in that action. So I'm, so I, I the way I see it, it, it's just not important to me. Um, and the way I see it, if I can have a face to it, then I'm probably going to communicate with that account. Um, if, if I don't see a face to it and it's some <clears throat> 20th century or 19th century leader of, of anything, um, I'm, I'm most likely going to assume that they're from the 19th or 20th century and that they're not actually alive. So I'm like, all right, cool. You, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so um, that, that's the approach that I have. Um, and th- I mean, and don't get me wrong. Like there are times when, you know, if, if you say something that isn't uh, the most popular opinion, 
um, you really do get it from all sides, you know, like when I mean all sides, like literally physically, you feel like you're getting it from Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, whatever it may be. Um, but at that point, I, I, I feel like you got to be very confident with your own words, with your work. And, um, and I think at that point, you'll feel confident with how you feel as well. And you'll be able to just come out of the, come out of the flames from that, like the, like the Phoenix. So that's, that's, that's my two cents. I don't know if I'm helpful, but I hope it does. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Javid, you have anything to comment on this? Uh, to be honest, not because I don't have much experience actually on it, despite that I was been, uh, maybe I had similar experiences, but I do not usually keep the track of how I am dealing with all this stuff. And I usually live day, day by day. Like, I usually forgot whatever happened uh, past. So again, not the best person to comment on, but I guess uh, Rich was uh, uh, quite clear on the matter and I do not really have anything more to add. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question from Easter XAK. Um, the, f the second one is probably a bit too uh, technical, uh, but the first one is uh, directed to Javid. Uh, the question is, how advanced is your Farsi, given that you posted information featuring the correspondence between the Safavids and Agwan Holy See? Very personal, but it's a question. Um, well, this question was this question directed to me because yes. I did not really understand. Can you maybe a short repeat it? Because yeah, it's it's uh, this person's just wondering how good your Farsi, your Persian is, uh, because uh, you know uh -huh. you were you put information concerning the correspondence between the Safavids and ah, the ah, okay. Albanian Holy See, the Agwan Holy See. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, uh, it is actually from uh, Karina Kostikian's research about uh, Persian uh, the, from the Safavid firmans that are kept in Matanadaran in a library in Yerevan. And she actually uh, translated the, these uh, decrees in Persian, uh, from Persian to English and published it. And I, I just uh, republished those, uh, translated actually from English to Azerbaijani. And in order to double check it, I sent it to actual Persian speaking friends in order to see if I've made any mistake or was there any uh, mistranslations on uh, Mrs. Kostikian's part. Uh, that's how I posted, but otherwise I have only uh, little to no knowledge in Persian. Thank you, Javid. Thank you. Let us see. Um, I believe there was a question about uh, language in general by Onik again, since we don't have, I don't see any other questions so far. So fa thanks, Javid. Uh, what you have just um, kind of indicated is that connections can work in many, many ways. And one thing I do is actually ask people, you know, could you read this piece in uh, Azerbaijani and tell me what it is? We can rely on machine translation. That's a plus for um, Twitter because everything is so short and machine translation can do sometimes a fairly decent job. But um, we do have this problem. And when Javid was in Tbilisi recently, we spoke about this. Um, I often wonder about the importance of Russian, but Russian is dying out in Azerbaijan compared to Armenia. But yet there is a big Armenian community in Russia. And so I wondered if Rich was considering about how to reach uh, that audience, um, how much important is Armenian. And, and for Javid, um, with regards to he, he, your tweeting in both Azerbaijani and English, and do you, do you notice that one language gets more reactions than, than the other? And just quickly to go back into those bubbles issues that was mentioned by Paul earlier. Yes, we are forming into bubbles, right? Um, everywhere is forming into bubbles. 
Um, and so we really need to break out of those bubbles. So how are we going to do it? Who's going first? Uh, please, uh, Javid, go. OK. Um, in, in my case, uh, I, I guess I've told you that uh, Russian, Russian language is uh, dying out because in, in Azerbaijan, at least, because uh, the level of education is uh, getting lower, especially in regions. So uh, maybe in, back in the Soviets, the level was much higher, but it's getting lower and lower, and we are uh, having much more uh, cultural uh, influence from Turkey or US, thanks to Netflix and Europe as well. So English is uh, gaining much more momentum. So when I, when I post stuff in Azerbaijani, I try to keep it like um, much more local, uh, like an English speaker probably does not uh, need what, I, what I've been writing about uh, libertarianism maybe because they already have lots of uh, literature on that. And we actually, I actually posted about this uh, in Azerbaijani tweet of mine, when I talked to uh, talk radio recently, they uh, they show they uh, like <clears throat> they showed me and uh, they wrote a little bit little bit of bio under my name, like founder of Rational Org. It's a website where we post about uh, translations from classical liberal stuff. It, it is not. It is not interesting for uh, English language follower of mine because it's it's not uh, it, he's not used to see uh, that thing from me. I am, it's more oriented towards Azerbaijani audience. We only post Azerbaijani there. So in my in my tweets, for example, when I post about oh my god, policies everywhere in Baku streets, what's happening right now? Uh, it it might be some uh, president visiting Baku or President Ali, Ali passing by. It does not really concern my in, uh, English speaking followers. But when there is something uh, going on politically in and around Azerbaijan, I usually switch to English. When it's about slightly about Turkey, uh, I use Turkish. But since I have zero to none uh, Russian knowledge, I probably don't don't ever post in Russian, but I understand that's the classic uh, stuff going on in Azerbaijan. Everybody understands, but they, they cannot reply you on the same way. And uh, I guess it's Rich's time. Yeah, Russian definitely is um, still in Armenia in, in literally and in physical sense, right? Like, in, I mean, sorry, linguistically and in physical sense. Um, so it, it, it's, you're right, it's pretty difficult for me to access a Russian based following given that a lot of people who are interested in geopolitical analyses are of Russian origin and I get messages almost every single day, can you please translate this to Russian in subtitles, I can read Russian, do I understand it, not as much, taught myself on an IRA float, constant IRA float flights um, in my three years in Armenia from ages 10 to 13. So. It's very minimal. Um, in terms of uh, people who are also interested in my work being uh, uh, in Armenia, not understanding English, that's also a language barrier, right? Um, but one thing that I'm trying to do much more is actually getting the research from, like for example, Russian-based maps, getting it from French-based maps. I, I've studied extensively French throughout my high school years and, and a little bit in college. So I, I try to make do with however much I can linguistically. Um, However, it does become a barrier, and I've, and I've noticed that significantly. But not only does the language become an issue, but also the platform of communication. So, for example, uh, um, TikTok, uh, the algorithm based off, based off of me being in the United States, most likely isn't going to reach Armenia unless I put a, a hashtag in Armenian letters, which I thankfully can speak in and write in. Um, and, and that even is not going to go further based off the geo, you know, the geolocating of algorithms. Then you also have the platform in itself, for example, Vukontakte, or like for uh, 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 Russians may not be using uh, Instagram based off of a certain age limit. Of course, those who may be 30 years uh, in their 30s and, and lower are using 
uh, Instagram, but I would imagine anything above that would be in, uh, using Facebook. So there, there's numerous barriers that not only are language, but it's also the, the, the platforms in itself. And anything that I'm receiving in Russian, I, I try to do what you mentioned, Onik, um, the machine-based translation. And of course, uh, I have the, 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 the luxury of having my family uh, being uh, able to speak in Russian. I can connect with them too and make sure this, hey, is this right? What does that look like? And, and one example I could give that I'm constantly uh, referencing or commonly referencing is Sarkis Saturian who has geopolitical analyses in Russian, and it's, it's, you know, it's pretty relevant. And the people would probably be interested in that that don't understand Russian. So I simply use the machine translation and an Instagram story, and then based off of how the interaction is, I could see that people are sharing it with one another and, and following each other. And when I see Sarki Saturian translating it in, from English to Russian on my posts, uh, I noticed a Russian-based following that does speak English to a, a, a certain level following me as well. So there's there's also a, a level of cooperation that I'm seeing uh, with other researchers that I could that I can work with to help me with these language barriers. So um, I, I don't have the answers. I'm I'm probably terrible to be answering this question, but um, yeah, that that's that's at least my methodology. If if that helps shape the picture. Thank you, Javid and Rich. Um, we have actually another question from Diego. Yeah, sorry, last one. <laughs> um, it's a different question, it's a similar question, but different to both of you. Um, so to Javid, Javid, you've been open on social media, um, on Twitter specifically about your past as a nationalist, so to say, when you were way younger. And you, you always reflect on that and kind of make fun of, of this past. So I wanted to ask you, um, you know, to share if, if you wanted to share and if you don't, it's okay. Uh, when did you click, you know, like when did, when did that, did that uh, nationalist Javid became something on, of the past and maybe how was that process? Because I just think it's interesting of, Especially, I think it's, I, I really appreciate when you share that because it shows, you know, that people can learn or can change and we're constantly, all of us, we're improving our, our best version of ourselves. So besides thanking you for, you know, reflecting on that, I wanted to ask if you maybe were, were willing to share a little bit about that. Um, thank you for this question. Uh, obviously, this change, uh, did not happen overnight, uh, so I had to. I had some phases in between, and uh, as you as you as you have seen, I was I was most writing in English back in the days because I was studying at English speaking high school and uh, it was trendy or cool. I, I said it's Facebook, no, everyone. It's it's made by Americans, so I I should write in English, uh, and. Uh, and I am sharing those in order to, as, I, as you have said, to uh, look at the past and see how much I do not recognize myself, uh, that the guy who was writing this stuff, but I can uh, see how I, how I have changed. Uh, it was very gradual, but I could say that uh, the, my move, uh, when I graduated from high school and moved to Turkey to study at the uh, university, Big Kent University, it was the major game changer of my life. And uh, uh, back then I was uh, quite homophobic and uh, pretty much nationalist and even to the levels of racist. And I saw this just casual, uh, just British guys uh, who came for Erasmus exchange, casual just kissing like, uh, and I, see, I saw that uh, God has not sent any thunderstorms on my way. So I thought, yeah, maybe these are normal people. Then I started to talk to other people and I actually met first Armenians uh, in the real world, like physically in Turkey, actually. Uh, so these were the main catalyzers for my life. And I tried to post uh, and reflect on my past in order to see how how people like like in 2021 are using same arguments that I've used 10 years before and uh, try to 
talk to me with such arguments. Uh, I feel that uh, everyone needs his, his or her time to grow and it will, it will it's change with experiences. And uh, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying that I'm the ultimate form of beautiful, beautiful best form of humanity, but I feel I think that by experience uh, we can uh, improve ourselves. Uh, that's how, how I actually met Onik and uh, stay every, wherever I go to Tbilisi, I stay at Onik's place. And I think it's by the time you grow out of your uh, little yourself from your uh, boundaries set by others, you upon you, forced upon you. And uh, when you come to think for yourself, you can actually judge better the others as around you as well. And uh, I guess that's why I'm still keeping some nationalists around me in hopes of that they might uh, change for the better side too and in hopes of I might influence uh, for the positive side too. I guess uh, that's how, how I am utilizing my past experiences. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Javid, uh, but I wanted to rephrase my question to Rich because that it doesn't apply to him. Um, I mean, I don't follow you on TikTok because I don't have a TikTok, so I don't know all of, but a lot of your TikToks are retweeted or reposted on Instagram, so I know what you posted on Instagram. Um, and it does call my attention that I've never seen you, you know, using racist language or anything that's, you know, indirectly racist or things like that, or terms that might not be, you know, like a bad word in itself, but that imply, you know, negative um, stereotypes about Azerbaijanis or, or Turks. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you if um, is that do you do you like consciously like uh, think of the the way the words you choose and, and how you name things or I mean or is it just naturally so to say like do you have an extra effort of making sure that you're not saying something offensive so to say? I think it's it's my experiences. You know, um, I've I've constantly and and. I, I always try to analyze uh, why a person is the way they are, and it can always lead to the past. I'm, I, I like to connect with the social constructivist theory commonly, actually. But um, I, I look at my past and I understand that I've constantly moved. I, I've went through two, two high schools, three middle schools, three elementary schools. Like I'm constantly moving, so I'm constantly learning about people. I'm constantly learning how to interact with people. Like, for example, um, in college, that was a culture shock for me. Um, similarly, so I, you know, maybe in my high school years, I wasn't understanding some liberal concepts. And until I moved to San Francisco, literally the hub of liberalism of, of, of the United States. Um, and it, it hit me when my first international relations teacher, when I was on the fence of really majoring it or not, because I started off with geography, but then I joined international relations after this experience was my my professor is Turkish and I hadn't come across a Turkish person before. Uh, Dennis Ilhan, he, he, one of, one of my favorite people I know. And he, uh, I, he basically provided us a, a, a conflict for us to, to present to the class. And I was keen on, you know, presenting, um, the, you know, the, the geographic, uh, outcome of the Armenian genocide, but I was, you know, in, in that moment, you don't know how to interact. There's no blueprint in, in how to interact in these situ situ situations. And I was one of the last students to, to, you know, pr put my rough draft. And he goes like, why did it take you a long time, man? And I'm like, I honestly didn't know whether I should do this or not. He gave me the green light. He's like, dude, this, this is something we need to talk about. This is difficult stuff, but we need to talk about it. And, and I want you to do so. Um, and, and that's when I realized that, you know, there are things that we can share with, with one another respect or respectfully. Um, and this goes back to dialogue, right. Being able to talk to one another, um, and, and, you know, and, and that experience in itself should be an example, right. Um, playing basketball throughout the world for me, um, there was a moment in my life where I was contemplating professional basketball, which in basketball, you, you get a player that has any ethnicity and he ends up being your teammate. Right. I mean, you can you can look at Henrik Mkhitaryan. He was playing next to Ozil, which was of Turkish descent as well. Right. So the, these scenarios kind of pre prepare you 
on how to communicate to an audience that provides that emotional and mental cognizance of understanding how people can take information. And of course, it helps me that, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm more empathetic to situations um, because we've moved a lot in, in our lives. Um, and we've seen uh, the difference between a diaspora nationalist versus a nationalist in Armenia um, and, and what constitutes uh, a, a nationalist in itself and, and, you know, really diving into diaspora studies and understanding how a diaspora works and what the structure is, even if there is a structure, because um, it's so fluid. So I, I feel like, you know, it, it, it helps me for whenever I'm transferring this information. But um, I, I want to say it's natural, but it's also been a, a bumpy road since the moment I've, you know, uh, I've been presenting information since I've been 15 years old in high school. So it, it, I want to say it's natural, but also a lot of uh, a, a lot of obstacles to get there. Thank you, thank you, Javid, and thank you, Rich. There is a interesting just comment about translations by Easter XAK. I'm just going to read it uh, out loud, unless you want to do it yourself. <clears throat> uh, so the comment is that. Yeah, it's, it's just about translations online that you should also understand that word for word translation is an easy way to get at your uh, message wrong, get your message wrong. And that's particularly the case if you want to reach out to the Russian speaking audience. And I've actually realized that I've tried to use actually Google Translate, etc. myself. Uh, there is something about uh, visuals, actually, uh, again, by Onik, you want to ask yourself. Okay, I didn't have and, to. And first, these are interesting stats also. Uh, first, first of all, um, I think really um, a shout out to Bright Garden Voices because they've also shown, uh, much like Javid and much like Rich, uh, how these new tools can really play a positive role. So I want to congratulate you uh, all for that. Um, but yeah, with regards to visuals, um, to what extent uh, are visuals a better way to overcome? communications barriers. Um, yeah, there's, there's some stats I just found. 90% of uh, the information processed by the brain is visual. The human brain processes uh, images 60,000 times faster than text. And 80% of people remember what um, they see. Like I will not now forget that Rich is floating around the screen uh, at the moment for me. <laughs> so yeah, this is a, a vision I may have nightmares about uh, later. But anyway, so to what extent can visuals um, overcome these barriers and how important are they that they be adopted? And again, Bright Garden Voices are excellent in this instead of just producing a very boring um, graphic image to announce something they have a design team. And, and I think this is incredibly uh, rich. I, I have gosh almighty, I'm getting giddy now. Um, okay, I'm stopping now. <laughs> um, so, sorry rich, for floating. <laughs> you can go first, Rich. Since you... Yeah, I was, sorry, I was getting the charger. I thought, I thought I'd have enough charge for this, but it's like, I don't wanna just drop in out of nowhere. Um, I, I've understood it from, you know, I, okay, so when, when I was 15 years old, uh, my high school gave me the opportunity to uh, be the PA announcer. And when I was the PA announcer, I noticed that people were falling asleep when I was speaking. I was the kid that was like, hey, like first period, this is what's happening. Second period, this is what's happening. Third period, this is what's happening. And I noticed that people were falling asleep. And I was like, damn, man, like that hurts, you know? But when I noticed that I was making funny videos, whether it was on Snapchat, just explaining to my friends what was, you know, what's going on geopolitically. Uh, and I've been, I've been doing this forever. It's just like, you know, now it's coming out, but I've noticed that people are much more uh, interested in content that's visual. And when I look at it, I see that it's completely different going from platform to platform, meaning that Snapchat, you know, I typically don't go more than 10 seconds. Uh, TikTok, I try not to go more than seven seconds. And that's just for a wider audience. So it kind of provides a challenge for the, for, the, for the creator too. But you know that that is the most digestible way of getting your point across. So how do you, the, the, the question also is like, how do you create content that is substantial, provides uh, reputable information, credible, while at the same time being engaging and knowing the social interactions of modern day. And that is, that is a multifaceted 
thing that I'm still working with. But I, I do agree on it that, you know, majority of, of, of people are visual learners, meaning that you can be, you know, you can be only understanding a little bit English. But when you see my Instagram story with the maps, you most likely understand what's what. And I, and I try to make it as understandable because um, uh, it's 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 using flags. It's not necessarily using words. So for example, I like to show which territory, which area is controlled by who based off of flags. And then of course, there's some um, miscellaneous information that I provide after that. But in terms of, you know, a basic understanding, I feel like getting it just across to that level is my goal to help people understand on a geographic base what the political conversation is. Like people aren't necessarily understanding where things are, which is one of the most important things of this conflict. And if I can show them visually, which maps are visual stories, you know, one of the main things as cartographers is what story can you tell? And, and it's up to interpretation, right? You can manipulate data uh, malevolently. You could, you know, and you can also manipulate it benevolently in, in ways that people can understand in a credible way. So um, I, I think it, you're, you're definitely right. Visually, I, I try to make sure people can, can take it, even if it's not in English. And I go back to this, this idea of Michael Scott telling me, explain to me like I'm five. So, um, so that, that's, that's what I'm going to going to leave this note on. Thank you, Rich. Uh, going to you, Javid, um, I also perhaps it could be worth a mention. I remember you sharing the images of the two uh, soldiers, one Azerbaijani, one Armenian. They look like teenagers, very young. And I remember that got a lot of attention. So you might want to also maybe have a take on that. But uh, please, Javid, on visuals. Um like uh, when we are talking about social media uh, it's like uh, like an olympics rich is wrestling and on my hand i am running uh, on, like rich is, uh, it takes probably takes uh, some time to think about what video to make how to make it but when it comes to just transmitting the news i just sometimes make lots of grammatical mistakes when I just want to translate and run about it. And when it comes to visual, uh, I was like an old grandpa. So uh, it was not my richest part, but uh, I've seen the photo that you have mentioned that both these uh, kid looking men, you know, because they, were, they had this very youthful image and uh, apparently they were, uh, they were both killed in action during the war. And uh, I don't know who made this college verse first, but it was, uh, I saw it first from Gias, Gias Ibrahimov. Uh, and, uh, and I saw that this photo was, uh, this collage was shared around uh, more than uh, 300 times, both by Azerbaijanis and Armenians and uh, some other nationalities at, as well, but most Armenians and Azerbaijanis. I guess this was, uh, one of the striking striking colleges that uh, people that this war is not uh, is not a game. It's like uh, just by watching through the drone, you are not uh, you are not just watching a video. You are actually watching uh, human suffering there. And these uh, images of these these two young men were uh, reminded us that uh, not to dehumanize, dehumanize the other side. And uh, I, the true face of war and their faces, uh, I guess uh, people just don't wanna see kids dying. And despite that, these men uh, were like in uh, military age, draft age, uh, it still reminded them of uh, this calamity, this catastrophe, what the war actually means. Uh, yeah, I guess the, this, this image was one of the striking uh, ones throughout the war. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Javid. Uh, interesting comment by Paul. Nuance is almost non-existent on social media and thanks to Twitter's character limit 
it's even more impossible. Super hard. We have a question by Kamal Makili Aliyev. Would you please uh, ask it yourself? Yeah, thanks a lot, Arnold. I think uh, you you have uh, read the comment that was addressed to my question that was on the chat. And my, my question goes both to Rich and Javid. Thank you very much both for, for being here. Very interesting to, to listen to this discussion. Um, I came across on Twitter that Rich said that, I'm sorry if I misquote you, but but be patient with me, that one of your motivations is to, to uh, well, to present here in this meeting is um, to help researchers know how to better connect with wider audience and social media. That was some, somewhere in your comments. I think I just came across it. And as a representative of a research community, I would really much appreciate the, any advice that you and Javid can, can give, especially interesting is your thoughts uh, about how to, to make our information uh, be, be so, well, it's not translated, but communicated properly to the audience because research is always nuanced while social media seems to be very much prone to generalizations and judgments and that's what's dominating. So what should we do? Thank you. And uh, Rich, you can go first, I believe. It was first directed to you. Thank you for the question. Um, and so one thing that has helped me is, is understanding my audience. Um, and in, in, you know, based off of what platform you're utilizing to reach an audience, that may be different, especially the, the mode of communication, of, of course, as well. So for example, I look into the data. I, I see it as, uh, as my readers being consumers. Unfortunately, capital society, that's how I have to look at it. And in this regard, I look at the data of my Instagram following. I look at their age. I look at their uh, gender. I look at their uh, location. For example, on my um, Instagram insights, it tells me majority of the people, some, uh, approximately 60% is from the United States. Then it says 30% is from Armenia. And then the rest is from Canada, uh, Australia, uh, Brazil, Argentina, different places. So then that allows me to frame my understanding. Then I then continue with questions to my audience saying, you know, uh, like I give them polls. The, like, uh, for example, do you understand what is happening in Nagorno-Karabakh? Do you feel conf like confident that you can explain it to another person? Now, of course, there's a lot of nuances to these questions because it's a binary that throws them into, but then there's options where you can help them choose from four options, like from a level of, uh, not so confident, confident, very confident, and none of the above. So then I get a better understanding of where my audience stands, and it, it helps me frame my teaching from there. So it's almost like uh, uh, building a curriculum as a teacher. Um, but because social media is able to provide you that real-time data, how many people have shared it, how many people have saved it, then you know uh, whether your content reach the far audience. So for example, my most recent one where it, you know, it's as simple as a meme, right? It's so silly that a meme can be explaining a situation in a certain area. So I know that my destination, ultimately my end destination is for people to get searching online. And I put my name at the very top where it leads them to my Twitter. And then my Twitter is then a guide for them to understand the conflict, at least from my perspective. And I noticed a bunch of the comments, like for example, I wrote the Caucasus and then Iran is involved, Azerbaijan is involved, Turkey's involved, Russia's involved, Armenia's involved. And half the people are like, Iran's not in the Caucasus. Everyone was just mad in the comments, Iran's not in the Caucasus. And I'm like, okay, this is getting people to think a little more that it doesn't necessarily have to be the physical location. So then they start Googling, they start looking into it and hopefully it can lead them to the right path. But at least from, a, a, from an academic perspective, I try to push Google Scholar to people that didn't even know that's an option, right? Uh, people that go to like, let's say Newsweek or even Buzzfeed for their articles uh, or Facebook posts. I try to push them out, out of that place. So um, long story short, I don't want to go too much into it, but if, if you would like to connect with me afterwards, I'm more than happy to, to elaborate on this, but uh, I would su suggest to check into the data insights. And if this is only through published work, I would look into who is accessing your published work, if that's a, a possibility digitally. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Javid, what advice do you have for researchers wanting to reach a wider audience, such as 
you know, people with a lot of followers on social media? Uh, I don't have really much to add, but uh, the KT does this uh, important work or used to those, uh, these visualized trends happening in uh, social media, Azerbaijan, in social media, and sometimes did other countries too. And uh, this is, but this is how I know uh, KT. I think the, uh, how do you say, interprofessional, uh, communications between uh, your uh, field, your field could be uh, political science, but uh, some other researchers uh, field could be data science. And by uh, connecting and uh, maybe asking for favor or help from that uh, data science guys, uh, information or research, uh, we can have, uh, maybe you can have much more uh, good, especially visual, visualization helps in that regard to see what uh, you are dealing with and what social media is actually saying. And, you know, there are some tools that can actually, uh, by judging and by learning the behavior of uh, accounts, can tell uh, how much of these uh, hashtags has been tweeted uh, how, how how much how many percentage of uh, these were by fake accounts by trolls, and you can also uh, refer to this data and uh, judge by your judge by uh, according to this data. Uh, in my in my experience uh, uh, during the war, especially during the war, my account had huge uh, numbers of. Uh, fake accounts that have been uh, had these names of Slavic or Russian names, but uh, profile pictures were from all ethnicities are Philippine, like African nations and stuff. And I immediately understood that uh, these were uh, fake accounts. And uh, I actually connected, uh, uh, consulted an uh, Armenian data scientist that. Uh, are these fake? And if these if these people are fake, could it be a trouble for me? Because they could have tried uh, to mass report me, and uh, maybe may, may, uh, my account could could have been suspended. And uh, I think when when we put numbers into details, and most most uh, importantly, to visualizations that graphs and every all this juicy juicy tasty stuff that makes data interesting to us. Uh, I think by using these tools and interfields uh, communication collaboration, it it could be much more easier for researchers who are not in this social media field. Thank you. Thank you, Javid. Uh, thank you both. Thank you for the question, Kamal. Uh, since I don't see any more questions, I just have one question. And this is a bit more broader, but you both, both of you, uh, Javid and Rich, you're on social media and very active, you know, sometimes you see a journal article, you know, gets dozens of views, but something you put online gets, you know, spread so far and wide and to, you know, vertically and horizontally across audiences. And what is really, do you think, the power, the potential of social media uh, in terms of, you know, what information and also, you, you know, like starting movements, etc. And even though it's been here for a while, uh, in some ways, we're just beginning to see it being used or mobilized in different ways. And do you, I mean, as the years go by, do you see social media playing a bigger role, uh, you know, for various reasons, better civil society, um, people connecting, movements, and what, what future, what uh, potential does this have for the Caucasus, maybe? if you have any comments on this. Uh, Javid? Uh, actually, this is a topic that we have discussed with uh, on Nick uh, back in Tbilisi. I guess we also made a, a podcast about it is too, but long story short, I guess, I think that uh, in 
while all these borders are closed, be it for because of conflict or be it because of pandemics, since uh, most of the borders are closed between the nations, we have uh, very much opportunities to uh, very less opportunities to travel. Social media is perfect place to actually uh, get to know each other as uh, we are doing right now here. Uh, because like I've I've seen uh, Rich only on Instagram and uh, it it was only only on the occasion that he was referring to me on by translating some news and uh, otherwise we wouldn't have known each other uh, we have we are living miles apart and I guess social media is perfect place for uh, this type of discussions. Back in the back in I guess 2015, there were like Facebook pages that was like adapted from Reddit uh, called Country Balls, and there, there there was Armenia Ball, Azerbaijan Ball, Turkey Ball, Poland Ball, and stuff like that. Meme pages used mostly, and that's how I got to know uh, some Armenians who were really interested in geopolitics but um, were also eager to talk to someone from another side, the other side. And I guess social media, if without social media, we wouldn't have achieved uh, this. And I guess just talking to each other, you know, just a little bit to share and uh, share our opinions uh, helps us to understand each other more and without social media it would take a lot a lot of time we would have to rely on government's efforts which is uh, which is not uh, expected of them these days so i guess uh, social media helps us to connect one on one one on one thank you javed rich do you have any anything brief to comment about this yeah, uh, and just to clarify, the question is, you know, the how, how does social media move forward with this in terms of research? Is, is that what I'm understanding? I'm sorry. Not, no, 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 just not not just research in terms of, you know, uh, the its power and potential in, you know, various ways. You know, uh, do you see it grow like year by year? How and uh, and yeah, and what potential does it have for the Caucasus, this conflict, Armenia, Azerbaijan, perhaps? Oh, of course. I mean, social media is here to stay. And, and the, the pandemic really proved that it also can increase very rapidly over time and, and like in, in a short amount of time. And you can see that even in consumerism with online shopping. Right. So people that were never really shopping online arrived and now only shop online. That's their only mode. Now they don't even enter a certain uh, a Zara store to, to pick it up or, or whatever it is. Um, but we also have to be very cognizant of how social media is moving forward as well. So, for example, um, one example that I want to bring, I may not necessarily be on topic right now, but it's just to frame an idea of how social media can also be uh, utilized by the, the platform provider is, for example, the censorship of Donald Trump. Right. Whether you like him or not, the, the president was silenced and censored during his during his his administration days um you also have um, organizations that are proven not to be russian state affiliated with the sign russia state uh uh media which provides this understanding that now censorship may also be a problem that we see in the future uh, it, of course it, it provides us outlets like telegram to open up um and and others but that's what my main focus is moving forward is when those when these apps do get censored because i would imagine at some point all apps become dwarfs similar to stars what's that going to look like and how does and, and personally i'm looking at how does research fit that world because you know at the end of the day social media is such a quick outlet which can be used in both positive and negative negative ways but what does that look like for the future because if, if we understand that anyone can really get censored and if you're providing empirical work uh, that doesn't reach a far audience in, in research, like I was just speaking of in the, in the past topic, but it does, for example, with a 40,000 like views or something and then it gets censored one day, 
what's the approach for that and how does social media uh, transform. So I think the question, even though it is very important, is will social media grow? It's in what context and how will it grow? Will it, it will it be a healthy organism growing moving forward, or is it going to uh, mutate based off of the platform providers? So so that just to kind of uh, get that thought out there, I feel like it's it's important to also uh, end that on that note too. Thank you, thank you, Rich, and thank you, Javid. And let us go to Rauf for the conclusion of this meeting. Before Rauf says anything, could I just give one statement before we wrap um, it up? Very quick. Yeah, I was just gonna say, um, everyone, everyone's questions and, and Rich Javi, everything that you guys have mentioned is literally everything I wanted to ask, but I'm not going to ask any other questions relating to that. I just wanted to say I appreciate you both making things accessible. Um, I think this is something that's really important with social media. We talk about it a lot in my history program about accessibility, uh, having certain knowledge accessible to the public. And even though scholars will write articles, they will write books, they will do the research and it's out in the public, but do people actually go and read it and go buy that book? And are they going to go and do that extra step research. Um, I think social media has its flaws, but it also is very good for opening that door for people. So you both are making things very accessible, even just like a starting point, right? And it opens that door. And I think that's really, really important. And I appreciate that you both are doing that because accessibility, especially with such heavy topics like this, it's it's so important. So just thank you. And I guess- um, Thank you, Jen. Yeah, of course. Uh, Rock, go ahead. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, I'm just going to invite uh, Javid and Rich. Is there any final words you want to share uh, with our audience? Javid? Um, not much, yet, but uh, I would like to do, uh, I would like to give a comment on what we are doing here right now. Um, uh, on my side, uh, uh, the, the, when you introduce Rich and when I get to see the what, what, which type of work Rich does, uh, I think that I got some lessons from me that I have to be much more Gen Z savvy uh, because like my phone actually uh, sucks and uh, I'm not a good at uh, videos and imagery in visual arts, actually. So I guess that uh, by maybe having this learning riches example, maybe I can also do some improvements like visualizing what I'm doing mostly. And uh, maybe, uh, and I want to thank you for providing me this opportunity and so not only i'm only not only i'm sharing my experience that's why how i can also learn from our other guests thank you thank you javid thank you it was a pleasure having you on rich any final words well i i just want to say thank you um i i know i've i've postponed this uh, once and, and I want to apologize for that, but uh, I just want to say thank you for the eventual moment of this. I've I've also learned a lot from the questions being posed, um, and and from Javid, of course. I've uh, I've been following his work for a while, and I, I think what we're what we're all doing here is important in its own niche, um, and you know beyond the criticism and, and the praises that we may get, we we believe in in what we're doing, and I just want to say thank you for everyone doing their part. Um, and, you know, this is this is a small step. And one thing that I say is um, that, like Andrea said, it's kind of a starting point. And I hope to see in 20, 30 years from now, instead of a conflict, still building on this concept here, because uh, the eventual goal is really peace. What, the, what, the way you, however you, you like to look at it, the goal is peace. No one wants eventual war. And as and as simple as that may sound, conversations amongst civilians like us, and even if we're outside of the country, whether we're inside of the country, some of us are here, um, 
it's important to engage in that dialogue. And, and that is the starting point that we're talking about, not only with our content, but also with our action. So I just want to say thank you guys for providing this platform. And uh, I hope to see you guys more. Thank you, Rich. Uh, we really appreciate you being here with us. And, you know, I think it goes without saying that I think I'm sort of speaking on behalf also of Bright Garden that we really appreciate your work on social media, the content you create, the information you share and the way you share it. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for everything you do. Uh, and please keep it up. Uh, Diego or the, or the co-hosts, any, any final words you want to, you want to say? Just joining the thanks to both our guests and our co-host for joining today the, the view of Leila so thank you Leila <laughs> and of course thank Javi you. Rich all right then so with that let us end this uh, great episode with uh, Javid and Rich uh, so if you don't, please follow us on our social media platforms Twitter, Facebook, uh, on YouTube Instagram. Uh, we are going to make this uh, the recording of this meeting available on our YouTube account and as podcasts. We will post it as podcasts online also. So please follow us for updates and we hope to see you all very soon in our next meeting. Cheers and have a great day or great good night. And thanks a lot to the audience and everyone who joined today your questions were really interesting thank you goodbye thank you everyone